Hello and welcome and we're really excited because we have with us Dr. Samir Velvai and everybody knows that he's he's like one of really uh, reckoned trusted pediatricians that we have. Uh, obviously you've had experience of working with so many parents and so many children and uh, today is something very beautiful that you said uh, when we were speaking about the right sort of growth that a parent needs to take which is about screen time is equal to narcotics and I need you to talk a little bit more about that because I don't think until you said it today it hit me that yes it's almost a drug that we're that we're kind of inducing or injecting in our children so how do addictions work they work because the substance that you use gives you a feeling of happiness or right. joy or some kind of pleasure right. that is not easily available in other substances or mm -hmm. the other things that you do in life and hence when it's a happiness and that kick that you get used to from that substance now when we have a child who's watching a screen right from a very early age and what happens is his social skills haven't developed so he is not going to have that much of enjoyment or happiness with connecting socially obviously he can't walk around so he's not going to have any other avenues to keep himself enjoy uh, keep himself occupied but in such a child when you give him a screen the amount of impact that a screen can deliver whether it's a simple nursery rhyme but the sounds and the lights and the graphics and the cartoons it's amazing so the child is completely fixated to that because it gives him a great sense of awe and amusement and enjoyment at an age where he is difficult for him to get anything else comparative. Now the trouble is because he then gets hooked on to this very high dose of happiness or satisfaction. Simple things like interacting with people around him may not be suddenly such a big source of joy. Right. Now what's happening is if you have a 3, 4, 5 month old child who's getting hooked on to a tablet, he's going to prefer that and he's going to choose that selectively over anything else that develops his social interaction. Right. And the child doesn't have social interaction, is not going to look around at people, not understand their social behaviors. He's not going to pick up simple things like when do you eat food? Yeah. For example, since we are talking about nutrition, yeah. that you need food in a plate, Correct. that you need to chew your food. Yeah. There are different kinds of food. And very often I have parents who tell me that the child only eats when he's watching a screen. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're just dumping nutrients inside. He's not yeah. really connecting to the satiety value of food yeah. or enjoying the food. Yeah. And food kind of connected us as children, right? There's so many memories that are associated with food when we were growing up, right? We would associate food with this would be summer food or we plucked this fruit or we grew up eating that so I think that sense of and, and I think children today also take food as entitlement versus gratitude right uh, and and I, I often feel this that instead of food being something that they need to be thankful for for moms and dads today it's become like a battleground now it's protein time now it's this time now it's that time there's so much of noise for the parent how do you simplify this for us I think the reason for why that noise is proving so effective unfortunately and that's because there's a insecurity mm. driven by guilt. Am I doing the right thing as a mom, as a parent? Am I spending enough time with the child maybe? Yeah. Am I spending enough money on the child maybe? That's the second question. And am I doing the right thing for the right child? Because somehow we've convinced ourselves that we're living in a ghetto. And if your child is in the top, mercenary is not going to get ahead in life. Right. And I think that's a very scary way of looking at stuff because that gets transferred onto your child. And I think it's very important to understand that you don't need to be a perfect parent. And your perfection as a parent, the child is not a report card on you. Yeah. The child is not a validation of you. Sure. I think in this race to kind of see to it that your child gets ahead, whatever that yeah. means, we are being too focused and we are doing things very artificially. Right. Moms a couple of generations ago were absolutely perhaps not so educated yeah. and fortunately didn't have an internet. So well the internet is like a sword. You need to use it. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I agree. I mean, if it needs to empower, you know, confuse you, right? And you need yeah. to know how to use it. So coming back to this, when people didn't have so much access to so-called information, they had knowledge. Yeah. And they didn't have information but they had wisdom. Right. So a mom would innately know what her child, what is it that she or he eats that agrees with him or her. And what is making that child better even that day mm -hmm. in terms of his mood? Right. And that's how they avoided allergies. Right. And they knew what was the right food to give to the child. And they saw the child growing. I mean, every But you're talking about an train. idealistic scenario. We right. also have to accept that today uh, I am not the mother my mom was. Right? I, I am not running 
I am uh, shouldered with a lot more responsibility, a lot more ambition, a lot more of you know a lot more of everything else that I want to do. So how do you disconnect uh, or how do you empower that woman who is a working parent uh, is not maybe uh, connected with her child 9 to 9 but still wants to go the complete mile in providing the right nurturing, right play, right nutrition. So when you mentioned all the hardships that people of today, not just moms or dads, everybody yeah. has today, you also forget the fact that they are mixers yeah. and they are blenders yeah. and you don't have to take that chakki and pisofai the atta. Of course. There are so many advantages as well. Yeah. So if there have been an in, uh, increase in say the professionalism, it is being supplemented by a huge technological boost which helps you do everything. I mean Absolutely. today you get ready made atta if you want to order it from somewhere. Correct. The point here is that while doing that, the first part that you said has led to guilt. And I'm trying to say there shouldn't yeah, be. Yeah, there shouldn't be guilt. No, I've, I've, I've moved over there. Moved <laughs> called mom. But what you are trying to say is that there is no reason to feel yeah. that you are not 24 hours with your child and I often get asked in workshops what is better, is it better to be a working mom or a stay at home, stay at home mom? mom and I say it's more than happy. a happy mom yeah. because if you are a stay at home mom and you are cribbing about the fact that you have to give up your career and you are unhappy about so many things that your child is eating or not eating yeah. it's just going to translate in a bad way to your child, you want to pass on the anxiety yeah. I think it's very important to understand this fact that things haven't really changed. I mean, I'd like to say this very clearly. Things haven't really changed. Whatever changed for the bad, it's been more than supplemented or covered up by the huge help that we've got from yeah. technology. And hence, it's very important to realize that children's intestinal systems, gastrointestinal tract hasn't changed. Their bones haven't changed. Their structure essentially hasn't changed. We are, because of this guilt, we are putting too much pressure on ourselves, trying to find out that one particular mix of nutrients that's going to make your child an Einstein. Now that's a problem. Yeah. And I also like what you said about now, the, the play part of it, right? That kids want to play because they want to play and they get joy out of it. But parents want success and, uh, and, and progression that, out of it. That's the narrative. Yeah. Everything in today's world, when you mention all that people are doing, yeah. I don't want that to lead to guilt. Yeah. But I want that to lead to realization that all this is rat race is pushing you to be extremely competitive. Yeah. And that competition and that competitiveness is getting converted into preparing that one particular meal for the child. Mm. I don't think today's parents are any way more disadvantaged than what parents were about a generation back. I don't think at all. But I think we've taken up this unfortunate competitiveness that we in society, see in society around us. No, I agree. But so I'm saying uh, as a parent, I am also bombarded with so much of information on deficiency of D3 or B12 or is your child having enough protein or is he growing right like how am I supposed to can I simplify this can process? Can I tell you I'll have to really think when is the last time I saw a child with a great deficiency of a nutrient yeah. in the city of Mumbai. Come with me to Palgar and I'll show you the malnourished kids. That's where we need to think for those moms yeah. not for our kids. Our kids don't have a deficiency. Yeah. They have an overdose of everything. <laughs> And why would you need to really wonder whether my child gets enough sun exposure for vitamin D? Okay. That's because we don't send them out to play. Yeah. Because like you mentioned, play has become performance. You want to rate whether the child is going for cricket classes, is he the top of his class, is he going to be the next Virat Kohli? If he's going for music classes, is he going to be the next top musician? So this is the problem and that's why everything that doesn't get us an immediate reward in terms of your child becoming the next superstar you are cutting off and hence unstructured play which you would do creatively where you would learn team spirit you would learn so many other things along with getting free yeah. exposure to vitamin D without any extra cost is all out yeah. and I think it's very important for parents to realize yes our lifestyles have changed our pressures have changed but life also is a lot more easier now you must understand because the pressure has changed don't bring in the competitiveness in the child and if you are as non-competitive you would be as your mom you would be unhassled and your kid would be left to lead, lead a more naturalistic life i think what we are doing today is just putting our child in the in the pavlovian trap where he's all just you know it's do this and you do that do this yeah. it's like a, applied behavior analysis if i may say even to a child who doesn't need it and the child is being programmed to live like a machine and i see that so often because if you have a child who's only been on apps and on being on a tablet in the first two three years of his life yeah. and then at two years he is sent to a play school 
He has no clue what other human children look like. He hasn't had enough exposure to human social interaction. He's going to find the other kids abnormal. Yeah. Or he's not going to be able to deal with them. And then you have the great shadow teacher being called in to assist your child. For what? So what I'm trying to say is that I'm not against modernization at all. But there's no need for us to change our basic human values or the way we led our life just because of this. So just to give an instance, when we are talking about sugar, why do we need to measure sugar in food? Whatever is cooked at home, that's good enough. Yeah. As long as a child is not overfed and you don't force him to finish off your plate, clean up the plate, I don't want anything left back. And again, like my teacher Dr. Amdekar taught us and I always like to take his name, he used to teach in the workshops, like he used to ask the mothers, when your kid was two months old, what were you feeding him? So obviously the mom would say breastfeed him. So did your, you decide how many ounces of milk your child would take as breast milk? Yeah. Did you know at the end of the day how much milk the child has taken? No. But yet you knew that when he cries you feed him, when he's satiated he'll stop. So you trusted a three month old to understand how much milk he wants and when he wants. But you can't trust a three year old yeah. to understand how much he wants to eat, when he wants to eat and when he should stop eating. Why do we at one year switch off from this natural mother to listen to what dietitians and doctors and pediatricians are telling you? So Let the child do it automatically and he's going to be fine. Yeah. Right. So thank you so much for that and uh, I'm really glad that we had this chat because it's going to really help a lot of parents and not mums alone. Like we always say that it's, it's, both. it's both. And grandparents. grandparents. Because I find a lot of stress being put on parents by the grandparents. And very often, I mean, especially when it comes to these habits, a lot of pressure from family, a lot of, and, I, and I, I, I don't think it's bad because it comes with a good intention. You can't uh, talk sure. about it as a bad thing. But you need to get grandparents onto the scene, you need to discuss with them, you need to exchange information with them. And also I think there is a little bit of logic and truth in what seniors say because there is wisdom, they may Absolutely. not have information. Absolutely. I think it's a great mix that we need. As they say, it takes a village. Absolutely. To totally. Thank you Thank so you much. So much.